opportunity this for conference board will now be recorded issues informally with staff and invited guests the board encourages members of the public to attend work sessions and listen to the discussion but there's generally no opportunity for public comment members of the public wishing to address the board are welcome to do so during the board's regularly scheduled meetings held twice monthly and we'll start with board communications uh commissioner thompson thank you mr chair um, and thanks to uh, Commissioner Webb for attending. Thanks to Nicole Bales for attending. We had a round table that was uh, so inspiring, so touching. Senator Wyden came to town and he wanted us to convene with the uh, mayors and the police chiefs uh, and other mental health folk and everybody to talk about the intersection between law enforcement and mental health. It was a wonderful conversation. Sheriff Phillips, um, you're a rock star. Talking about relationships as the key to everything. Um, well, you know what? I know it's a no brainer for you, but um, it, was, it was a beautiful instance of community in operation. And it's lovely because Senator Wyden said he got as chair of the Senate Finance Committee, one billion with a B dollars, hey, Commissioner Toyoka, to, um, to help communities address these challenges. So we're engaged in that conversation. It was a wonderful uh, meeting. Thanks to Chris Graham for his staff support. I mean, it was, it was a real uh, wonderful week in the 4th of July weekend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. If you're not speaking, if I could have you mute your your uh, feed there, your phone or your laptop. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to Commissioner Bangs. Um, I just took it easy this last week. There was a bit of an ebb in my meeting schedule and in um, just in general there at the end of at the end of june and so i enjoyed a long fourth of july weekend with my family and i hope that each of you were able to do so also so it was wonderful it was a really wonderful um small little break so great to hear thanks commissioner banks commissioner webb um i think i'll pass All right, Commissioner Webb, and we'll move on to Commissioner Toyoka. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It was wonderful to celebrate uh, this nation, you know, with all this going on in the country and uh, the havoc. It is wonderful, wonderful to go out and see, you know, people celebrating America and all the beautiful things it stands for. So that was really refreshing and wonderful. Um, just doing lots of research this past week about DEQ so we can get ready for today's meeting. Uh, very illuminating. We'll bring it up later on when we get into that discussion, but uh, hope to bring some valid points to the discussion based on a lot of the people I've talked to within the last week or so. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Toyoka, and I share your sentiment. It was great to see so many people at the Wharton Parade and uh, so many people on the waterfront. Just a, a fantastic weekend. And I don't have anything to share, so we'll move on to the next item. I think uh, we have uh, no legislative updates, so we'll move on to item two. Is Clatsop County Code Amendments, Operation and Maintenance Agreements for On-Site Wastewater Systems. And that is on page three of the packet. And am I turning it over to Nancy Mendoza? Or who? Hi, my name is Nancy Mendoza. And I'm one of two co-compliance specialists with Clatsop County. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, in 2014, Clatsop County Environmental Health Department uh, began managing the on-site wastewater program, including issuing permits for construction, certificates of completion, and performing required inspections um, for the Department of Environmental Quality. Clatsop County serves approximately 14 to 17,000 individuals, um, or approximately that many individuals are served by on-site wastewater systems. 
Of these systems, approximately 470 are pressure distribution systems. Pressure distribution systems under pressure equally distribute effluent to an absorption field or treatment unit. Of these 470 pressure distribution systems, there are approximately 100 systems that have not entered into a service contract or have failed to renew their contract. Under Oregon administrative rules, a service contract must be completed before the system is installed and must be maintained until the system is decommissioned. Since entering into the agreement with DEQ, EH staff, environmental health, health staff, has mailed the owners of pressure distribution systems letters outlining the requirements for these types of systems, but there is no me mechanism in the county code to address owners who do not enter or have failed to renew their service contract agreements. Because of this, staff is proposing the following changes to Title VIII of the Clatsop County Code. We want to establish a process for how environmental staff will notify the owners of these systems. We want to identify the process that code compliance would use if environmental health staff is unable to bring the owner into compliance. We want to specify the responsibility for service providers and specify the responsibility of owners for these types of systems. Staff has proposed that failure to enter or maintain a service contract should be considered a class A violation per section 1.11.010 of Class F County Code with a fine of $720. Staff is requesting input from the from the board regarding um, whether staff should proceed with the proposed code amendments and whether a fine should be assessed to system owners who fail to renew or enter into the required agreements. Based upon the direction of the boards, staff will either cease the amendment process, continue to make revisions for further board review, or move forward with the amendments as proposed. Thank you very much for the presentation. Do we have any questions from the members of the commission? Commissioner Toyoka. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for the presentation. Uh, I do have a few questions, you know, and uh, like I said, I've spent some time talking to various people about this. Uh, a couple things like, you know, obviously service contracts, I think they are a good idea, uh, but the providers, you know, the regulations on the providers, the consistency, the requirements that they must meet to become a provider. Um, there's a lot of inconsistency right there, I think, that's going on with the current providing providers we have in our area. Um, one of the fees, some of the feedback I have is like, you know, hey, if you have an agreement, then sometimes inspections and things are not being done, reports are filed, and then down the road, all of a sudden, there's a large failure or a large, uh, system to you know part of the system to you know to fix or replace and no real justification so this there's i think that part of the system might be broken as far as who's a provider what is it requirement to become a provider and what are the you know licensing or the certifications of the provider um staffing i know you're you're <laughs> working hard with short staff as is how do you propose to uh enforce this extra workload you know, and I think fines necessarily, um, I don't think necessarily a good thing, you know, since the system, I think, should be fixed before we start talking about fines. So I, I, I do agree with some of the things you're going for here, but I think we need more revision prior to anything being implemented. Looking at the providers, looking at the, the warranties that are out there that, you know, how are they licensed? How are they documented? What are the standardization of those maintenance providers? then we can get some consistency in how these systems are maintained. And then if somebody just says, no, I'm not gonna do it, then you have recourse. I, I understand. Um, I think that um, there, there are approximately only 100 systems out there, um, leaving more than 300 systems that uh, do have these service contracts. And I'm not aware of, because I don't, work directly with the uh, contract providers. I'm not aware of, of some of these complaints that, that are being voiced to you. So um, I, I can't speak on how the system is, is broken. 
So I think that's some of the things we need to look into prior to just adopting any amendments. Um, look at the full picture, see before we start endorsing providers, what are the standardizations of them, what are the requirements, and then then we can proceed, I, I believe. Okay, I do, I do know that they are required um, to be licensed through DEQ and DEQ does um, check their license status as well as EH staff on a yearly basis. Right, but again, I think uh, even from personal experience, they don't, you have to still call them, they don't call you, there's no scheduling, there's no consistency. So I think to, to work within our county, it has to have something more standardized uh, with for those providers before we can start talking about penalizing the, the, the people of the county for not per doing these uh, system checks. I, and this was part of the proposal was that um, we would be adopting the DEQ language, which, which uh, clearly states what is required. Right. Any other questions, Mr. Thompson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, Commissioner Toyok, I appreciate your research because it does, it's logical to check the provider end before sanctioning the consumer end. So um, thank you, Ms. Mendoza. I really appreciate your work in oh so many ways to protect public health and safety. I mean, that's what we're looking at here because serious diseases can result. This is a big deal. Okay, it, does DEQ have just a paperwork process or do they in fact adequately monitor the performance of the providers? That's, that's a really good question, I think. And I don't know if other counties have had this issue. So I, I'm not, I haven't done that kind of research. So I appreciate that Commissioner Toyoka did. So if we as a responsible board of commissioners want to guide our staff to really adequately promote and support public health, that makes sense to me that we look at the adequacy of what DEQ does. Now, we may not have any impact on DEQ. That's my experience with DEQ. I don't have much impact on what they do or how they do it. But at least we as a county can say, these are the standards we want to see operating here. And I don't know if there's any prohibition on our um, asserting performance standards on the providers of the service. So maybe that's a question for county council or DEQ or so. I don't know who else. But that seems to me to be a reasonable train of thought and a reasonable accountability scheme. And I like that. I like the idea of accountability. And in that regard, it occurs to me that there may be a couple of reasons that consumers are not, and we've got about a quarter of them, who are not doing what they're legally required to do. As I understand, staff has sent out the information so that anyone who needs to know can know. So that's the first part. Do they have the information? Do we educate them? then we can talk about their means to respond. Because do they know they need to? Are they willing to? Do they lack financial capacity? And I'm trying to remember, I've sat in AOC meetings and I can't remember what committee, what policy committee, but there were state programs to help support um, low income people who didn't have the capacity to take care of, of their um, septic systems. I think I remember that, but I'm not clear on that. If there, if there were programs to support willing but financially lacking consumers, I think we should let people know about that as well. So if we support the willing to be able by helping them see where they can get grants, not loans really so much, but grants to take care of that, that's in the interest of promoting public health. Only then do I think, should we look at having a consequence for people who are either unwilling, who are basically unwilling to comply with public law to support public health. So that's how I, that's my train of thought. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Commissioner Banks. 
Um, I agree with both uh, Commissioner Thompson and Toyoka. Uh, just that prior to punitive measures being taken, that maybe we solidify um, our process here at the county level. Um, can county reiterate how many people are not part of a required maintenance agreement? Approximately 100. Out of how many systems? 470. Okay, so, okay. Um, and and staff has had communication with, with those 100 folks? Yes, um, ever since um, taking over the program, staff has sent out at least two letters outlining the requirements for those types of systems. Okay, and have, have you received any feedback from any of these 100? Yes, um, environmental health staff has. I don't know how many have uh, entered into agreements um, since those letters have been sent out. Okay, I'd be I'd just be curious to see what the response was to those letters, because um, I, I know for many folks they they just didn't know um, that, that that this was something that they had to do, and I, I feel like we should have some grace for for that particular type of situation. Um, because I mean, I'm, I'm being educated in this and I'm sure, you know, many landowners probably have been or will be also. Um, and so I, I would just had to hesitate to, to push punitive measures prior to fully exploring the reasoning of why those few have held back from, from entering a, a maintenance agreement um, because I agree with Commissioner Thompson that there could be something that is holding them back and it could be financial especially since we are just coming out of a, a pandemic and an, an, an unemployment high and so um, I'm, I'm not against creating ordinance or drafting language it's just I, I would hold off on the punitive measures until we actually explore because um, if if somebody is just choosing not to do this, just to choose not to do this, then I think punitive measures just need to be taken. But if, it, if there's another outlining um, issue, I think we should explore it. Thank you, Commissioner Bangs. Any other questions from the members of the commission? Just, uh, just for my own knowledge, I, this is, this covers everything within the incorporated as well as unincorporated areas within the county, correct? So this, yeah. Yes. Within city limits? Correct. We, have we had any uh, discussion with uh, cities about this? No, I do no. not believe so. Do, and how many service providers do we estimate there are in Classic County? As far as um, pumper trucks go, which is generally the um, the people who provide these service contracts, I don't know uh, the exact number. I don't know if Annette or Lucas is on uh, this this meeting and can provide that number. Yeah, I just uh, I have to admit I'm not real well versed in in this, so I appreciate any information I can get, and I like the. The suggestion Commissioner Toyoka has been doing his homework on it, and I, I agree with him. I, I would hate to put something in place uh, without having all of the uh, inner workings uh, realized and how it's going to all uh, fit together. But any other discussion or any other questions from members of the commission? Commissioner Webb? Uh, yeah. I can someone fill me in on the intersection between the conversations about the issue that um, we don't have apparently locations um, to accept uh, the extent of the septage that is being generated in the county? Um, it wasn't regional solutions working on that or can somebody help me out here? I can speak to that. We are working with North Coast Regional Solutions, Business Oregon Energy Trust, and uh, the cities of Astoria and Warrington, as well as some other community stakeholders on trying to address the um, septage issue along with some other um, 
organic high strength waste materials that are causing po problems for their wastewater treatment facilities. Um, is there something more that you're wanting to know about the project? We're getting ready to go out for an RFP to um, determine the feasibility of siting an anaerobic biodigester that might be able to help with some of that. But the county is also looking at um, in regards to what we proposed possibly using some of the RF funds for was a transfer station because uh, anaerobic biodigester is a several years out project if it is feasible. And so we're looking at um, the possibility of a transfer station to help um, alleviate some of those traveling costs uh, for the haulers because currently they're having to go up to the Rainier St. Helens area to um, offload, which is creating um, you know, a lot of extra time for them. Um, and, and then therefore they're, they're commuting a lot more than being able to um, Wait. So are these the same providers um, who, uh, businesses, are these the same businesses that that uh, do the inspections on the septic systems? Yes. Or is, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, they are. They, uh, the, the pumpers uh, are also um, do the inspections, the service contracts. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess my feeling is that um, I, I'd like a lot more information um, in terms of, for instance, it it never occurred to me, I guess, that um, anyone who lives within the city limits would be on septic. Um, but obviously, that must be the case. I, and I'd love to know more about about that distribution. This is always an issue for me about, you know, kind of is the UGB the real indicator of, of urban living or not? Um, but um, I would, I'd also like to hear from some of these companies who are providing this service uh, and get some reaction uh, from them about are, are there constraints? Uh, is there capacity within this provider community to service all of these? We're talking about 20 some percent of of residents who are not in compliance with this requirement, I, that's a huge amount. Uh, and I would really love to know about what the reaction was when when these folks got a couple of letters from the county. Um, and I'd even like to see what those letters said uh, and the tone of them. Um, I have a significant area in my district uh, that is, uh, in unincorporated areas, but this is an issue I've never heard of for many of my constituents. Um, so I, I, I think I'd like, thank you, Commissioner Toyota, Toyoka for um, raising these issues because I, I, I think we lack information here on, on what's going on in terms of our, how our constituents feel and, and the industry that is also supporting supporting this. Thank you, Commissioner Webb. I see Commissioner Toyoka had his hand up there. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's kind of a two-pronged thing here, I think, is I believe that the warranties are great. I mean, if any of the homeowners out there, if they, it's much less expensive to maintain the system than it is to repair or replace one, you know, to be pre preventative instead of having to react to a repair or replacement. So as a homeowner, so, you know, it's much financially, it's much better for them. Um, but the mechanics of how we do this, that was my concern, you know, with, from the providers that are out there, what standpoint, standardization, and just a process, whether it's on our county website where you can sign up for, you know, these warranties, or there's something we can do for the residents of the county to make this more of a seamless process. And then two, in that same vein, how do we, you know, we don't need to pile on workload to you at this point at the county, your staff, um, and you know for environmental issues. You've got a large workload right now. How do we add on, you know, 
enforcement of fines, it, be, it would be almost seem to me like it would be, we have fines out there, but now we don't have a way to enforce it because you're too busy already. So how do we streamline that whole thing, you know, from implementation to how do you, you know, uh, ease of access for the members of, you know, uh, residents of Classic County? It would, um, most of it would be handled by the environmental health staff. Uh, with with more letters outlining the the requirements, and then we propose that it would it would then go to code compliance, where um, a notice of infraction would be issued. Commissioner Banks, um, I'm not a, against. Um, adopting an ordinance or regulation that's aligned with state law in regards to um, wastewater treatment. I mean, I feel like that's something environmentally that is extremely important. Um, I, as long as we are staying within the, the lane of the law, um, uh, but I do feel like, and I'll, I mean, and I'll probably reiterate what John just said, I do feel like that prior to the punitive measures that we we need to just really investigate what is going on um because traditionally and, and i know that this isn't everyone but traditionally most landowners care care about their properties and they care about um, the environment around them and so i feel like there's just a little bit more investigation that we need to do in in, in regards to the whys why is there you know 20 percent of the folks that are not part of an agreement so Uh, County Manager. Sure, Chair Quayle, members of the board. What I might su suggest is that staff um, come back to your board with another work session um, after we have time to touch base on some of the issues that you've raised, um, and then we'll, we will come back. Thank you, County Manager. Do any other further discussion or questions? Thank you very much, Nancy. Appreciate uh, your time. And uh, we'll be talking again, it sounds like. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next item is Oregon Department of Forestry update, page 25 of the packet. Uh, we're joined by Dan Goody and Ty Williams with the Department of Forestry. Welcome, gentlemen. And I'll turn it over to uh, Dan. Thank you, Chair, Commissioners. Uh, Don, um, Ty's going to kick this off and then uh, with a short presentation. Um, I'm Dan Goody, uh, Oregon Department of Forestry, District Forester. Um, your little handout gave me a promotion, said I was a state forester, but uh, just a district forester. <laughs> um, with that, though, Ty's going to kick off with a short presentation and then uh, we'll start tag teaming uh, this uh, particular issue um, as we go and are hoping to make this a conversation and a little bit of problem solving. So thank you for your time and your busy schedules to uh, help us with this issue. So with that, Ty, take it away. Thanks, Dan. Um, I talked to Teresa earlier, and I think I can share my screen here. I, I sent you an invite, Ty. Okay. To share your screen. There you go. Oh, great. As Dan mentioned, we use uh, Zoom and Teams, and uh, we haven't used GoTo in a while, so I'm going to be a little rusty here. Okay. So good afternoon. Uh, so you guys are seeing my notes there, aren't you? Are you guys seeing my notes? Okay. Yeah. We're gonna do. We'll do it the other way then. Wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to do that or not. 
Good afternoon, uh, Chair Quill and members of the board. My name, as Dan mentioned, is Ty Williams. I'm the uh, District Operations Coordinator for the Astoria District. And we would like to thank you again for holding this work session and giving us the opportunity to discuss some of the recent challenges we are having managing the Clatsop State Forest. Through the discussion today, we're hoping to give you some background on State Forest, discuss some of the recent challenges we are encountering, encountering in managing public lands and how ODF and Classic County can work collaboratively to develop solutions for some of these shared concerns and safety issues. Um, state forests are managed by the state of Oregon to provide economic, social, and environmental benefits over time. So what does that uh, mean exactly? Well, the most direct economic benefit is revenue from timber harvests that come right back to Clatsop County and local taxing districts with state forests in their borders. When timber is sold, about two thirds of the revenue comes back to local governments to pay for services we all uh, need and use. <clears throat> Here, the Astoria District uh, ODF manages almost 137,000 acres of border forestry land. In the last fiscal year, timber sales off these forests generated $22.7 million for services such as county law enforcement, Clatsop Care Health District, schools such as Jewel and Clatsop Community College, Sunset Empire Transportation District, and many other important services. We also manage about 2,000 acres of common school forest land or about 1.5% of the Clatsop State Forest. State Forest also directly employs a number of local residents, as well as indirectly through private companies that help harvest, transport, or process timber, as well as contractors who help replant forests after harvest. We're also seeing increased use of State Forest for recreation, and we'll discuss that more in a minute. The draw of State Forest help, helps us support uh, jobs that rely on visitors. Many of the logs harvested on the Clatsop are milled locally in Warrington at the Hampton Lumber Mill, and we work with many local logging and road building contractors. Soil and water protection and enhancement are an important role for state forests. This area is also important habitat for threatened and endangered birds and fish. We're obligated to protect that habitat. Each year we plan projects that improve access and remove barriers for fish and find ways to reduce sediment runoff. And after harvest, we plant native trees to create the next generation of Oregon forests. During the most recent planting season, which usually begins in mid to late December and goes through uh, April, we planted approximately 850,000 trees on the Astoria District. As I mentioned a minute ago, state forests also support a lot of recreational activity and it really runs a range from camping, hiking, off-highway vehicles, horseback riding, mountain biking, mushroom hunting, target shooting, fishing, hunting, and about whatever else you can imagine. Over the past five years, we've seen increasing use of our campgrounds and responded to the demand by nearly doubling the number of trails we maintain statewide. On the Clatsop State Forest, we have five campgrounds, over 30 miles of motorized trails, and 20 miles of non-motorized trails. Managing lands for all these benefits is one of the most rewarding parts of working for ODF. We work hard to achieve a balance of that triple bottom line of economic, social, and environmental benefits. But recently, recently we have been dealing with some challenges that aren't new, but have increased significantly. The issue is illegal dumping, camping, and abandonment of vehicles and RVs. Not only is this illegal practice unsightly, but it brings with it a possibility of contamination to soils and streams. There's also a risk to our employees or the recreating public from dirty needles and other contaminants. During recent times, or during certain times of the year, there is also a fire risk from this behavior. As you can see from one of the pictures on this slide, a vehicle that was, tor a vehicle was torched after it had been dumped. 
This problem is not unique to uh, just ODF. Many of our fellow forest landowners, as well as communities around Clatsop County, have seen an increase in this type of vandalism and negative behavior. We have tried to combat it by closing or installing gates in areas where this activity is unusually high, but in some cases this isn't uh, possible or would block access to thousands of acres of public land, which is a trade-off we aren't willing to make. We've worked with uh, Clatsop County Sheriff's Office Force Patrol Deputy to help identify, identify problem areas, increasing patrols and public contact with those individuals found in these areas, and reminding users of our dispersed camping rules. <clears throat> this has had a minor positive effect in some areas, but with only one forest deputy to cover our 137,000 acres, along with all other forested acres of Clatsop County, makes it very challenging to get a, a major change behavior. <clears throat> Since 2019, our district has, had, has spent nearly $52,000 cleaning up dump sites, abandoned vehicles, and RVs. This year alone, we have already spent over $9,000 cleaning up two sites. Uh, for most abandoned motor vehicles, we can find a willing tow company that will remove them off the forest and onto their impound yard. For abandoned RVs, this is not the case. In order to begin cleaning up an abandoned RV, we have to go through the lean process by securing the vehicle so it can't be removed. This is usually involves blocking the road that the abandoned RV is on or hauling it just to a secure site if that is deemed safe. Um, but once we go through this process and acquire title to the RV, which takes a minimum of 30 days, then we can begin the removal process, which can involve many trips to landfill with our uh, dump truck. It has only been in the last two budget cycles that we have been we have begun to earmark funds for this increased level of cleanup. But every year that level seems to increase and is becoming uns unsustainable. Funds for this work come directly from ODF's one third share of our forest management activities. Spending these forest development fund dollars on this type of work decreases the funds available for non-legally mandated business activities such as new recreation sites or trails. And I will add that um, you know, we have uh, costed in our budget for uh, a seasonal forest patrol deputy that, that we, we have an agreement with uh, Clatsop County's uh, Sheriff's Office to provide. In, in the last two summers, we, we have not or the, been able to find an individual uh, to do that work. Um, usually it's a retiree, a recent retiree, um, or uh, maybe a, a incoming um, deputy looking for work or uh, but this this summer we do have uh, a seasonal deputy so um, and those those deputies usually are on from Memorial Day through Labor Day which does add a little bit of uh, assistance in the woods but those those funds also come directly out of um, ODF's third share so we are here today to bring greater awareness to the issues we are encountering in the Clatsop State Forest and ultimately work together with leaders of Clatsop County to seek viable solutions. Some possible solutions are outlined on this slide. Um, and these are just some things that we've we've put together. We, um, we don't think that we've come up with all of the solutions or all the ideas, um, but we also know that this problem is bigger than just ODF. As I mentioned, it does reach other uh, forest landowners, many private landowners, and many uh, municipalities. <clears throat> we realize, realize that they're not going; these issues are not going to go away overnight. But with many of us working together, uh, a positive impact can occur in a shorter amount of time. Ultimately, we will continue to manage the Clatsop State Forest to meet that triple bottom line of economic, social, and environmental benefits. Challenges that were outlined here today just make achieving that objective harder to obtain. But knowing the challenge we face, we believe being proactive and planning for them is the best way to maintain and build on these benefits state forests are achieving today. So this is the end of our presentation, but we had we we would uh, we were hoping to have a discussion and some uh, maybe to generate some further ideas and seek solutions um, with the board today. Thank you very much.
I appreciate the presentation and and uh, and Dan. I uh, I had one question about the disposal. You said that uh, the only landfill that will take uh, this uh, cleanup material or stuff that you're removing from the forest is uh, Long Beach, Washington. And uh, can you can maybe expand on that exactly why it's not being able to be done? Yeah, our our local, local land our local landfill um, will not take um, the gray or black water tanks or waste without some kind of I think some kind of a documentation of its safety. Uh, the one in Long Beach um, doesn't seem to have a problem with that. Um, I'm just speaking on personal experience. I know even taking building materials to our local landfill here, uh, you know, they want, you know, if it's drywall or whatever, they, it has to be produced after a certain day to make sure there's no asbestos or whatever. So uh, I don't know if, if it's uh, state laws that are more strict with disposal in Oregon than in Washington or what exactly it is. Um, but, uh, you know, the RVs are problematic. We, even if they're a motorized RV, we can have, um, you know, a lot of tow companies will come get abandoned uh, passenger vehicles, but they don't want to touch uh, the RVs just because of the quote hazardous waste involved with the black and gray water tanks at the very least. Um, so that that has been the issue uh, for us. We've had to uh, use our excavator to go out um, and and you know a lot of times have to pump the tanks first with a disposal company and then we crush uh, the um, RV and put it in our dump truck and then take it across to Long Beach. Yeah, thank you, Ty. Yeah. I, this is becoming uh, an issue on private forest lands as well, an increasing uh, issue in, in cleanup and uh, the expensive cleanup. I see our sheriff is on. I'd like to ask uh, Sheriff Phillips for um, maybe some, some of his uh, perspective on, on dealing with this issue out in the, out in the forest land. Well, we, we deal with this issue on the streets as well as in the forest land. Um, Certainly, disposing of RVs is very difficult. Uh, we, we, uh, the way we deal with it is we have the vehicle towed to the county shops at at our expense, and the the uh, public works uh, disposes of the vehicle in the same way that Ty is talking about. Um, because tow truck companies uh, usually with an impound, uh, they make their money when the person comes to recover the vehicle, and if they don't then they they lean the vehicle and then try to sell it well if it's a burned out shell it doesn't really have enough value to uh you know pay an employee to drive an expensive tow truck in the woods or even on a city street to to go get it it's not worth their while so they elect not to do it so it's certainly a challenge i, I know that our forest patrol deputies um find it difficult to enforce some of the really messy messy campers that uh stay a long time of course the rules we got to work in is Correct me if I'm wrong, Ty, but someone can camp at a location for 14 days in a row and up to 90 days on forest land in a year. And so even if we bump someone to a new location, we got to uh, keep track of them at least 90 days before we can kick them out. Uh, so, so it is difficult. Go ahead, Ty. Ty. Yeah, it's uh, actually 42 days in a, within a 12-month period. But oh, it's 42 days? 14 days in um, within um, uh, 30 a 35 day period, but uh, as as Matt as uh, Sheriff Phelps mentioned, there's um, it's tr it's troublesome sometimes finding these camps, and then when you do, uh, if no one's there, you have to actually make contact with the individual there to start the time to make sure you know who's camping there, and um, you know we've definitely seen an increase in that, and then. A lot of times they leave the um, RV or whatever they have behind, and um, a lot of times it's not in a condition where we can haul it. And I worry about, especially some of these trailers, taking them. Uh, recently, we were able to take one to the, um, we had permission from Classic County to, to store it and lean it at the uh, county shops in Jewel. And uh, we were able to haul it there for the most of the way through our, our logging road system and only about two miles on the road, but uh, you know, I worry about um, 
wheel bearings going out on these or something you know, or them falling off the frame of the and causing you know further harm to the environment or to the motoring public so it just is really really a problems problems from cleaning these up and getting them and then if they get left um you know then it's a, a target of opportunity where they get shot at or torched in the woods we had an uh, rv a couple years ago during the middle of fire season up above our nat creek campground that was torched off in the middle of the night you know luckily it didn't spread and cause a, a a forest fire but we did lose some reprod that was near it um, so uh, it, it's just a growing problem that we're trying to figure out how to deal with i'd also like to add we're trying to work with the da's office on some more solutions we have cited some people for offensive littering uh, related to abandoning uh, vehicles but um, apparently that statute doesn't work if it's a vehicle now if it's a tow behind trailer um, then maybe it would work for an offensive littering citation but a vehicle that's motorized uh, doesn't work so yeah thank you uh, commissioner thompson thank you mr chair well um i think it's a growing problem i think it's a problem related to people being responsible so are people irresponsible because they don't know any better or because they can get away with it so that we we're really back at the same conversation we just had on the previous item who knows what the rule is are they educated then are they capable of doing the right thing i know dan's got an opinion on this one this was a softball over the plate for him wait but then there is enforcement of consequences so we got problems all the way along maybe we need to look at state law maybe we look at county ordinance a, a concerted community response is required so dan tell me what you think it ought to be well you hit the nail on the head there that I mean, th these are symptoms of a bigger problem but i can tell you personally it, it's a fact that the majority of the people we're talking about know the rules as good as anybody and they know when day 14 is up they're moving their camper to another spot up a different spur to start the clock all over again and then they can blow smoke move they get lost on the radar and they get found somewhere else miles away and the clock starts again so they're, they're playing it um and this is a subset of a bigger problem with uh, some homeless communities in the forest um whether it's in the city of warrington uh, marked by the kia dealership in uh or up by Mill Creek on the east end of town, um, where they're both those particular spots are involved in forest activities, um, and they may get displaced. They're going to go somewhere else. Um, so we have people with illegal septic systems, um, illegal fires. Um, you know, we're actually including um, this as part of our fire strategies now because it's not predictable. Um, we can look at weather indices as far as weather and fuel indices, what fire behavior is going to be. But with people camping at oddball spots, doing oddball things, it's, it just throws a randomness to the whole predictability of fire starts um, that uh, they could be in some really squirrely spots. Um, but we chose to bring this to you guys today as a, here's a slice that we can measure this particular problem set and come up with some solutions to it it's not going to be an all-encompassing solution um, like you talked about commissioner thompson i mean this is a big one that we can't solve ourselves but we can do something about the rvs and cleaning that up uh, within our authorization and working with you all do we have the right mix of authorities funding and to be able to clean these up so we have safe forests for people to recreate in um, and then holding people accountable for their uh, bad behavior. Yeah, great. Thank you, Dan. I see Commissioner Banks has her hand up. Um, I mean, we're all discussing. It's a it's a multiple multiple pronged issue. Um, we've got prevention, we've got consequences, and we've got cleanup. Um, has the department considered? And I know that this is just you know kind of an oddball conversation, but for um, in regards to prevention, has the department considered, you know, game cams or anything like that in areas that are commonly used or commonly um, being 
destroyed, I guess. I can tell you, Commissioner, that we've deployed several of them over the years, and and we we have less than half of them <laughs> left. <laughs> they they okay. seem to walk away, but yes, we 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 use them regularly in Forest Patrol. Okay, and has that helped at all, or is that just something? Because I mean, as as a county, I mean, that could be something that we consider um, increasing. I don't know that it's helped because we run into the same problems. It, Do they it, get shot out or taken? Well, they, they get taken, but it doesn't change the, the camping rules and people moving. Um, and then, like Dan was saying, we lose them for a while, find them again, clock starts mm -hmm. over. Uh, a lot of time with the abandoned vehicles, even if it goes up and you got a glimpse of it, it doesn't say who it was that was driving it. And rarely are these things registered to mm -hmm. the actual owner. Okay. I mean, I'm just also considering other issues because you know the issue that we had out in, at the Napa Water Association when they they shot out our um, one of our wells, and it was 72 hours before we could get that well repaired. And so I just was thinking along the lines of all of the issues that we're kind of having on state lands and in private lands. Um, but yeah, so prevention is going to be obviously difficult because I feel like people already know that they shouldn't dump in the woods. Um, I feel like that that's kind of a common co common knowledge. Uh, you shouldn't litter. So prevention is kind of a, a difficult one, especially if we're not locking gates or if we're if we're not um, able to track folks. Um, so looking at cleanup, uh, looking into possibly our our recology and and seeing uh, potentially why we're not being able to receive that type of um, debris is, is a consideration, but also um, have you guys struggled with, with uh, houseless cleanup in regards to, um, oh, what is it called? It, it's basically needle waste, but I don't know, for some reason I can't pull it out of my brain right now what it's specifically called. Um, is there an increased, yes, thank you. Is there an increased expense for that? Yeah, I, I can speak to that. We had a site um, oh, a couple years back that had, you know, over a thousand used needles at the site. Uh, and it wasn't something that we wanted to put any of our employees into because we don't have that kind of expertise in cleaning that kind of site up and the, just the dangers of that. So we had to hire uh, a company by the name of Biomanagement Northwest out of Portland uh, that deals with cleaning up homeless villages or or contaminated sites such as that and they have all the proper PPE and they came down and even with all their PPE they still had an employee have a needle go through his boot so that just speaks to um, how dangerous these are you know I just hate to think of a family out in the woods recreating and you know hiking down a trail and some kids coming across a, a homeless camp that, that's abandoned and you know, they leave a lot of times they leave the tent and everything behind, as you can see from those pictures, um, you know, and, and, you know, you know, kids are you know curious and picking things up. So, uh, you know, I hope it doesn't take something like that to get, you know, affect change, you know, at the legislative level. Um, I just know that working with the sheriff's office, you know, they've been great to work with, but you know, they're, they're limited in the officers they uh, have out in the woods. And then they're also limited. Um, in in you know doing all the legwork and then if it goes to the DA's office and and they're not going to prosecute because it's oh it's a forest crime and it it's not as important as something that happens in a city or whatever um, you know I know it gets frustrating for our forest patrol deputy as it does for our, our employees because you know we take pride in our forest and um, just to have people go out there and trash it uh, you know isn't isn't something that we like to see. See Commissioner Thompson and then Commissioner Toyoka. Commissioner Thompson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Commissioner Toyoka, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you are a subject matter expert in the area of registration of vehicles. So, how feasible is it to have stronger laws on the books for every for every uh, person who? who takes in like i traded in a car to a very well respected local dealership 
they never they never took my name off the registration. And so they said, oh, I called them and they said they blew me off. I think to myself, you know what? You should have to change that registration when I sign it off to you. They never bothered to do that. And it's a well-respected local firm. So how about, again, looking for some other avenues of influence? And maybe you could have influence with uh, car dealerships, for example, or, or people who buy and sell motorized vehicles to have some teeth in the changing, the updating of the registration. Because I think that's a major escape hatch for a lot of people. I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, the law is that when you sell a car, a private party, you have 10 days to notify DMV that you in fact sold it. And usually there's space in the uh, document that you should fill out who you sold it to. And then it'll be flagged in the lens as notice of transaction submitted. This was a company. Well, I know. I think most of these motorhomes though are uh, being sold for like $500 and then they change hands about seven times. And then you don't know who actually owns it when it finally is dumped. Commissioner Toyoka. So, Commissioner Tom, you, you said uh, well respected. Does that mean you you uh, did it from Lums Auto Center? <laughs> uh, I'm nice, nice, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there is there are processes, and we've conformed to those as far as the dealership level for vehicles. Uh, when people trade them in or we we purchase them, paperwork for the DMV paperwork is signed at that time. Um, how is it processed? You know, once it leaves us, I don't know. You know. That's kind of one of those, it could be 30 days to 90 days. That's why we, they issue 90 day temporary tags uh, because it, the processing time. Um, but to speak to this issue, I think, um, I think you know, the, the outcomes I think are very predictable, you know, as far as what's happening out in our forest and, our, and, and in our communities because of the policies that are going on within the state and, the, and federally. And I think, like Ty was mentioning, it's going to have to be addressed at the legislative level first before we get that trickle-down effect to us. Um, it's hard to work from the bottom up when the policy's already out there. Um, so it's, it's I, you know, some of these, like I said, I, I believe it's a very predictable outcome what we're seeing right now. And it's unfortunate that the minority are affecting the majority. Um, sure, sure, Phillips. I was going to say, did anyone check out House Bill 3124? Yeah, it talks about <clears throat> camping on public lands and providing notice. Uh, for example, if someone's camping in a cemetery, you need to give them 72 hours notice to vacate before a funeral. So um, another area where it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a more encompassing program, especially for uh, ODF and W or, you know, Work Department of Forestry, because if you look at some of the, they're talking about the revenue required. Well, if the forest revenue decreases, you know, then where is your funding coming from to, to take care of these issues? So I think it's a great, it's a larger issue than what we're looking at right here. And I, I believe it has to be started at the legislative level. Um, a lot of the policies implemented there have helped perpetuate this, and we have that's where we have to go back to help stop it. Thank you, Commissioner Tulliokan. Commissioner Baines? So I guess I have a couple comments. I mean, one, I, I would appreciate being able to, now that we have a lobbyist or, or we're contracting with a lobbyist to push for um, uh, more teeth, I guess, in, in the law uh, regarding these issues. Um, I, I would fully support um, that because I feel like, you know, municipalities have, have a, those the same issues, it's a, a different a different approach versus our state lands and our, our private industry forest lands. Mm -hmm. Um, and safety is a huge issue, and I think that with the forest fire concerns and, and safety concerns, um, I, I, would, I would much rather try to be in front of the issue versus behind the issue after something devastating happens. Um, and so I guess as I'm talking to ODF today, to, to Mr. Goody and Mr. Williams, um, I guess the question is, is I mean, we're, we're fully willing to work with you. Um, but what do you see us um, being able to do or being able to assist you with? What would you like from us? Because um, I feel like we're, we're open to 
almost anything for the safety and well-being of our, our forest lands and our constituents. And so um, moving forward from today uh, for further conversation, um, what, I mean, how can we help? I mean, that's that's kind of what I'm asking. Uh, what do you go back, Ty, to that one slide? You had some suggestions from ODF. I thought that those were good ones. I you know we've talked about most of them, but maybe we could go back to that that list. Sure. Let me see if I can figure this out again. But yes, I, I agree with Commissioner Toyoka on, you know, a lot of this might have to be addressed at the legislative level and it's it might be outside of our our realm. Is that showing up for everybody? That's that's it. Okay. Yeah, and, and you know, kind of what you know what we've been brainstorming here was, you know, uh a multi-agency uh, impound yard would be great. Uh, where not only us, maybe even municipalities and other forest landowners could bring these um, vehicles if it was safe to do so um, to one location that was secure. Um, you know, and a pie in the sky would be it would be great if uh, if uh, and I don't know where it would fall if it would be in. Um, public health or uh, code enforcement or what but uh, it'd be great if we had one point of contact to lead this process where you know maybe we could all pony up some funds into a pot to help um, you know pay for uh, uh, you know someone to do the legwork of the lean process someone who so it's you're not having to recreate the wheel every time you know people come and go it might be one person who knows the system and how it works it might even be a third party contractor that we could get interest in, in doing that for us um, um, but, but that I think that would that may help be able to help uh, you know I'd, I'd love to hear from um, Sheriff Phillips if he thinks that that would be uh, of help uh, and then uh, you know I think I think lobbying for stronger fines would be great and uh, you know maybe uh, helping our um, local district attorney's office understand that you know this is a problem and and um it's a bigger problem than maybe maybe some people realize uh that that does it could have lasting effects on the environment uh out even though what's happening out in the woods out of sight out of mind so um those are just some things uh and then if we could you know if there was ways to get our local uh landfill to um, take some of this out that would save on the cost of disposal because you're again not driving an extra 45 minutes to an hour to dispose um, of this stuff so county manager I have a question for you is Don on I'm sorry I can't see him on my screen he's on I'm on Okay. Um, is it possible to have staff explore um, the option of um, a, a multi-agency impound yard, like the feasibility of that for our county? Oh, absolutely. I think this is just another one of those topics that um, will require a table for all of us to get together and and to really brainstorm on. And certainly that's one of those um, okay. that we but onto the list. Um, so I, I'm I think, very interested in that table myself personally. Uh, just yeah. throwing that out there. <laughs> um, if I could, I think it's it's kind of similar to the table that we've been working with Dan um, and with uh, the Fire Defense Board folks and others just to talk about wildfire issues. I think this might fall into that same create a table category and then get the multi-jurisdictional leaders um, brainstorming ways that we can cooperate and hopefully move the needle uh, okay. collectively. So. Uh, I appreciate that because I do feel like there is a tie-in to fire danger in this, especially, you know, after they, they mentioned the fact that this is part of part of their, their um, considerations when they talk about um, fire control and danger in our area. Um, so thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Banks. Any other questions, comments from the members of the commission? Commissioner Quill, I would say, uh, you know, presence, law enforcement presence in the woods does, I think, you know, from what, what we've seen help. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there is one full-time forest patrol deputy for, uh, you know, all of the Clatsop Forest lands. And I believe, you know, that was established, that funding for that was established many years ago um, by the board um, with 1% of timber revenues. Um, but if there was any way to add to that, um, from my perspective, uh, it'd be great. We just, even this last weekend, you know, we have, um, as I mentioned, we survey for threatened and endangered species, and we have surveyors that go out uh, during the breeding season of for marble murelets and uh, spotted owls and survey. And for spotted owls, that usually starts at dusk and goes well past midnight. And then for um, marble murelets, that's usually around 3.30 to 4 in the morning when they hike in into their survey location and have to be there at dawn. Um, and I've received over this weekend about four or five emails of uh, strange and disturbing activity that they've encountered out in our forest during these times and um, almost threatening to our surveyors. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I know this is going to drive up our costs in the future of our surveys because it's a danger. It's becoming a danger where they may have to have two surveyors together versus single surveyors just for safety purposes um but it's hard uh because i know the forest deputy can't work 24 hours a day seven days a week so uh, um but i think a lot of the activity we see that the results of do occur uh when when our staff isn't around and you know we have usually have folks on anywhere from six six in the morning till six in the evening but i think the activity is from six in the evening till six in the morning so uh, that that's just something else I'd add to a solution list here. Thank you, Ty. Uh, I see Commissioner Bangs has got her hand up. Commissioner Bangs. Just, just a quick question. Um, do you see that these issues are, are more seasonal or is it a year round situation? Is it warm weather associated or is it, you know, just solidly year round? I think the, the warmer weather increases the activity, but I, I do believe it's going on year round. Um, you know it a uh, lot of you know a lot of wood theft uh, a lot of dumping you know they so it's a year-round type deal and and what we've seen lately a lot of it seems like a lot of cars are getting dumped and then stripped um so and or they use our sites to hide and camp out during the day and then go out and do other various activity in the evening off of our lands in in our uh, urban and rural neighborhoods yeah, and I know, I know that wood I know that wood theft is an issue. Um, do we regularly in the county um, have punitive measures in regards to wood theft or or anything like that? Yeah, we we do, and we've had cases uh, that the DA has taken up where, you know, we've caught individuals felling live trees on multiple landowners and you know s selling that and um we had we had one oh about a year and a half or two years ago in the napa area where some was on us some was on uh, hampton lands and um it did get prosecuted and we did get some restitution back from that individual so um we do that they, they have been in, uh, prosecuted by the da's office some of those cases but again that's a hard one to find because you just about have to catch the people red-handed um, you know, once they get on the highways, they can say, well, I got it from so-and-so's property or whatever, so. Mr. Thompson. Well, thank you. So, so drones, I mean, are drones, especially ones with infrared, is that a cost-effective way to monitor when people don't or can't? Is that an access for technology that would help us? That's out of my area of expertise. Yeah, I would say a direct answer right now is no. Um, that would, if we had the system up and running, um, you know, we're using that on fires right now. 
um, but it has not been modified or framed in a way to observe humans and their behaviors. So it's a whole different environment that you'd be using a drone and the software platform with that we don't have. Um, you would have to talk to Homeland Security or somebody else to actually traffic people like that. Well, I'm telling you, I mean, I remember I've, I've worked with criminals and there are people who don't want to make their living any other way. And they don't change that behavior until the consequences are too costly. So I want to balance civil liberties with if we've got the increase in law breaking behavior that we are seeing in a whole lot of different places, we can't afford the staffing to address it. We do have some technology that might be useful, but again, this is a longer term solution and there are civil liberties concerns. I don't know how we address it, but if we don't try and wrap our arms around it and be more proactive, these become um, opportunities for people to continue to do wrong. And then people who don't, who don't want to do wrong can't use the forest. So, so I think we need to engage in longer term. I like Commissioner Bang's suggestion of, of looking um, for a legislative way to address it. And I think we have to consider what does it take to, to create standards and methods for assuring law abiding behavior. Because that's what we're talking about. We aren't, we don't want to invade civil liberties. We want to assure law-abiding behavior by having observation, monitoring, and consequences. I don't, I don't know. That's what occurs to me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Um, Ty, Dan, Sheriff Phillips, would you like to close other comments here? Yeah, I'll throw some in and then let Ty close us up. Um, I really appreciate everyone spending time on this. This has been something that's been growing and I thought we had a little better beat on it until COVID happened. And then this thing's morphed and shifted and gained momentum as far as uh, behavior out in the woods, bad behavior. Um, we are limited in ODF to fire laws and resource protection portions of uh, the statutes. Um, we have no jurisdiction other than for arson. Um, so all of the criminal behavior falls to law enforcement. Um, so this is where we, you know, gathering of the minds and getting together. Um, you know, I like the idea of getting together at a table, you know, problem solving this. And then uh, with any good problem solving, what are the measurable outcomes? You know, what is a measure of success? Um, to me, having uh, a place where we could haul all these derelict vehicles so they can get triaged and sent to the right places to get recycled, crushed, whatever, um, would be one good step forward, uh, coming together with a potential legislative concept to develop a fund to deal with abandoned RVs and campground refuge um, would be another good one. Um, some of those are bigger lifts. Um, I know there was a run during this legislative cycle um, to do some sort of tax on RVs. I can't remember if it was for registration or purchase. Um, you know, like any good uh, LC, you know, it takes probably two sessions to get through. But that's probably going to have legs, maybe not in the short session, but during the next full session. Um, you know, so this falls in that bigger arena. I think you were talking about Commissioner Thompson of, you know, setting these things up. And then having people from the ground talking with our elected legislators um, about, you know, what's eating our lunch at home. You know, I realized this doesn't compete with the whole homeless conversation, but it all takes one fire and a spot in the wrong weather window. And we've got uh, Echo Mountain all over again, and it'll be right there over Seaside. Um, so that's what keeps me up at night. So uh, I'll end <laughs> on that tower note. Let's tie clean it up. Thanks, Dan. Ty. Yeah, I just I just wanted to thank you, uh, the board and uh, you, Chair Quila, for the time today uh, and bringing this uh, to the forefront. Um, and appreciate um, 
County Manager uh, Boone to let us let us know um, that he's willing to sit down at the table. I think that's great. I would also say that uh, Clatsop County Sheriff's Office has been a great partner for us and uh, great to work with, um, you know, throughout this and, um, you know, uh, being able to get that additional deputy, seasonal deputy that we, we pay for in the summer, this summer is going to really, you know, get some extra eyes out there and, and give our force, the normal force deputy, some added, added help. And um, just want to thank um, Sheriff Phillips for that. Yeah, thank you very much, Ty. Sheriff Phillips? This is certainly a challenge that we've been working on for years, but I think that uh, when we work on it together, we'll find some solutions. They might not be perfect and all encompassing, but we can make progress and I look forward to doing that. Yeah, thank you, Sheriff Phillips. I think you know that the commission stands right with you. We want to see a solution and work with the Department of Forestry and other uh, community partners to find some solutions. My experience just in Warrington alone, seeing a, a lot of these encampments on private forest lands and uh, you know the stolen property that goes with it and the needles and, and the real hazards, uh, it's, it's something that we've got to find some solutions for and be creative in doing so. So I really appreciate the discussion. Thank you very much, Ty and Dan and Sheriff Phillips. And that is the last thing on our agenda this evening. Or today, I guess it's not this evening, is it? Any anything for the good of the order? Okay, and we'll look forward to having a roundtable and further uh, working with you guys on on finding some solutions here. So thanks again for your time. And with that, I'll go ahead and adjourn our work session today. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>